This month is Flying Machines Flyer Drive. All month, Potstirer Podcast and the other great shows on Flying Machine are releasing special content, such as collaborations and additional episodes. We are hoping to grow our network, and to do that, we need the support of wonderful listeners like you. Of course, listening to our podcasts, checking out our blogs, and telling your friends is super important. And we appreciate that from the bottom of our hearts. But if you're willing and able, we would love for you to become a Flying Machine patron. And here's the thing. There's something in it for you too. This month, we want to give you a taste of the additional content you'll have access to by being a Flying Machine patron. At the $5 a month diver level or above, you will be able to access monthly bonus episodes from the awesome podcasts of Flying Machine. For more about the Flyer Drive and becoming a patron, go to flyingmachine.network slash support. The following is a Potstar Podcast Patreon bonus episode I released earlier this year, and I'm releasing it here for free as part of the Flying Machine Flyer Drive. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And as always, thank you for listening. Within evangelical Christianity, a common approach towards the LGBTQ community is encapsulated in the mantra, love the sinner, hate the sin. In other words, the idea is that evangelicals are expected to love queer people without accepting their sexual orientation or gender identity. It's the kind of mantra that leads evangelicals to build what they call seeker-friendly churches that are welcome to LGBTQ people while maintaining a homophobic agenda that people don't discover until they are already emotionally invested in the church and the church community. And they want to actually get involved further than just showing up for Sunday service. It's deception. This is why actor Chris Pratt's church affiliation, which he's been vocal about, is so controversial. Pratt attends Zoe Church in LA a megachurch that many other celebrities attend, such as Justin Bieber and Maria Shriver, which is affiliated with Hillsong, best known in Christian circles for pumping out Christian worship music popular in evangelical services across the U.S. and around the world. On the church's website, it states, quote, Our church is a place where our doors are open to people of all backgrounds, regardless of where they are at in their journeys and we hope all feel welcomed, comfortable, and loved." End quote. Yet, many former attendees report that Zoe's doctrine only recognizes and supports marriage between a man and a woman. In addition, Parent Church Hillsong, which has endorsed conversion therapy, has stated they, quote, do not affirm a gay lifestyle and because of this, we do not knowingly have actively gay people in positions of leadership, either paid or unpaid, end quote. This duality is an oxymoron. It is a thin veneer of acceptance and allyship that covers up rejection and bigotry. You really can't have it both ways. But the sad thing is that there are people steeped in evangelical Christianity that wholeheartedly believe this. Cognitive dissonance is pretty much required in evangelical Christianity. This duality also came up in my research for the series on Rev. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These are the most recent regular episodes, 46 and 47, so be sure to check those out. So while looking into Dr. King's life, I came across a pair of letters from eight white Alabama clergy from different Judeo-Christian religious traditions who sought to discourage him from coming to Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, and encouraged Birmingham's black community not to support him. These open letters, which were published in the local paper, had particular historic importance, come to find out, because these were the very letters Dr. King was responding to in his famous open letter, Letter from a Birmingham Jail. This small part of American history 
is quite intriguing and enlightening, and I thought it would be worth sharing with you in this month's Patreon bonus episode. I am your host, Jay Poole, and this is Pot Stirrer Podcast. In early April of 1963, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC, headed by Martin Luther King Jr. and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, or ACMHR, began the Birmingham Campaign. At this time, Birmingham, Alabama was, in King's view, quote, probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States, end quote. While the city was split 60% white, 40% black, economic opportunity was severely limited for black residents. Employment for blacks was limited to manual labor, domestic work, groundskeeping, or businesses in black neighborhoods. The average income for blacks in Birmingham was less than half of whites, and the black unemployment rate was more than two and a half times as high as whites. Even where employed, blacks were last hired, first fired. Racial segregation of public facilities and businesses open to the public was strictly enforced, and only 10% of the black population in Birmingham was registered to vote. When blacks in Birmingham resisted the social order, violence from the Ku Klux Klan or the White Citizens Council often ensued, and bombings of the homes of civil rights activists, black churches, and black businesses were commonplace, enough for the city to be nicknamed Bombingham. The ACMHR was founded by activist Fred Shuttlesworth in 1956, right after the state of Alabama banned the NAACP. The ACMHR used both the legal system and protests to desegregate public facilities and businesses in Birmingham, but faced a great deal of resistance, even when they won challenges to segregation laws in the courts. It was to the point that the city closed public facilities rather than integrate them. In 1962, Shuttlesworth was thrown in jail for violating the city's laws on segregation, and he felt his organization was not getting the results it hoped. So he reached out to the SCLC for help, asking them to come to Birmingham. So while SCLC was an outside organization, they were indeed invited by a local group. The goals of the Birmingham campaign were to desegregate its downtown stores, institute non-discriminatory hiring practices by government and private employers, the reopening of public facilities closed in defiance of judicial integration orders, and the creation of a racially integrated committee to oversee the desegregation of Birmingham schools. Dr. King in particular felt that focusing on specific aims would make them more successful in the campaign. The arrival of SCLC to Birmingham was not a secret, and not everyone was happy about it. Black business owners such as A.D. Gaston, while supportive of ACMHR, were none too thrilled about SCLC coming in. Gaston felt that he had an in with white business owners, and negotiation would eventually bring about change. Of course, white segregationists, who were not fans of SCLC and Dr. King, didn't want them showing up either. But even white residents, who were not solidly in the segregationist camp, felt that the outside assistance was unhelpful. This latter group included a number of white clergy in Birmingham. They called themselves the Reconciliation Committee, but the core group of eight men were dubbed the Birmingham Eight. The Birmingham Eight were as follows. Bishop Nolan B. Harmon, Bishop of North Alabama Conference of the Methodist Church. Bishop Paul Harden, Bishop of the Alabama West Florida Conference of the Methodist Church. Bishop C.C.J. Carpenter, Bishop of Alabama, Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. Bishop George M. Murray, Bishop Coadjutor, Episcopal Diocese of Alabama. Bishop Joseph A. Durek, Auxiliary Bishop, Roman Catholic Diocese of Mobile, Birmingham. Rabbi Milton Grafman, Temple Emmanuel, Birmingham, Alabama. Reverend Earl Stallings, Pastor, First Baptist Church, Birmingham, Alabama. 
Reverend Edward V. Ramage, moderator, Synod of the Alabama Presbyterian Church in the United States. This group of religious leaders wrote two open letters in early 1965, and these were published in the local newspaper. Neither letter mentioned Dr. King by name, but it was clearly implied who the men were referring to. The core set of clerics responsible for the letters were dubbed the Birmingham Eight. These core of eight men were the religious leaders who signed on to both letters. Most of these men were Protestant pastors and ministers, but the group also included a Catholic bishop and a Jewish rabbi. The first letter, an appeal for law and order and common sense, was more broad, and it was addressing the changes that racial integration, which they thought would be coming down the pike pretty soon, would bring. This letter was from the Reconciliation Committee, including 11 clergymen, the Birmingham Eight, and three other signatories. It included these key passages, quote, We believe our people expect and deserve leadership from us, and we speak with firm conviction, for we do know the ultimate spirit in which all problems of human relations must be solved. It is clear that a series of court decisions will soon bring about desegregation of certain schools and colleges in Alabama. Many sincere people oppose this change and are deeply troubled by it. As Southerners, we understand this. We nevertheless feel that defiance is neither the right answer nor the solution. And we feel that inflammatory and rebellious statements can lead only to violence, discord, confusion, and disgrace for our beloved state. We therefore affirm and commend to our people, number one, that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, two, that there may be disagreement concerning laws and social change without advocating defiance, anarchy, and subversion, three, that laws may be tested in courts or changed in legislatures, but not ignored by whims of individuals. 4. That constitutions may be amended or judges impeached by proper action, but our American way of life depends upon obedience to the decisions of courts of competent jurisdiction in the meantime. 5. That no person's freedom is safe unless every person's freedom is equally protected. 6. That freedom of speech must at all costs be preserved and exercised without fear of recrimination or harassment. 7. That every human being is created in the image of God and is entitled to respect as a fellow human being with all basic rights, privileges, and responsibilities which belong to humanity. We respectfully urge those who strongly oppose desegregation to pursue their convictions in the courts, and in the meantime, peacefully to abide by the decisions of those same courts. Thus, we call on all people of goodwill to join us in seeking divine guidance as we make our appeal for law and order and common sense. End quote. This first letter was essentially a call for both sides to follow the law, including addressing segregationists specifically, focusing on the importance of following the law. The second letter written in early April around the same time SCLC was arriving in Birmingham, was called A Call to Unity. This was signed only by the members of the Birmingham Eight. It was similar to the first letter, but was specifically targeting the Black community, Black activists, and Dr. King. Quote, We, the undersigned clergymen, are among those who, in January, issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We expressed understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could properly be pursued in the courts, but urged that decisions of these courts should in the meantime be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there had been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which caused racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication 
that we all have opportunity for a new constructive and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree, rather, with certain local Negro leadership, which has called for honest and open negotiation of racial issues in our area, and we believe this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area, white and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formally pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense." End quote. Nevertheless, SCLC began the Birmingham campaign in April 1963. On April 10th, the city was able to secure a state court order barring protests and demonstrations in Birmingham. Black activists that were part of SCLC and ACMHR decided to march in defiance of the injunction. And on April 12th, Dr. King was arrested and sent to the city jail, where he sat until April 20th, so a little over a week. While in jail, a current newspaper and some paper were smuggled into King's cell. This is where he first learned about the call to unity. Addressing the Birmingham Eight, he penned a response that was over 20 pages long. It was quite a long letter, but remember, he was in jail. When you're in jail, you got nothing but time. So Dr. King completed his letter from a Birmingham jail on April 16, 1963. The letter read, in part, quote, My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Alabama and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law, as with a rabbit segregationist. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust, and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice, is in reality 
expressing the highest respect for law. I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, he has been caught up by the zeitgeist, and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations, and he must release them. So let him march, let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city hall, let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church. I have heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. End quote. The full letter is much, much longer, but it is definitely worth reading. Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail is, to this day, a great primer for learning about him beyond the most famous lines of his I Have a Dream speech. So this is something we're thinking about as we talk about the inspiration for a letter from a Birmingham jail. Who were these white moderates? What did that look like for these men? And what can this situation teach us about being true allies to individuals and groups suffering from oppression? One thing to understand is that while the Birmingham Eight had points of agreement which led them to sign on to two public letters, being moderate meant something slightly different for each of them. In the book Birmingham Revolution, author Edward Gilbreth places each of the Birmingham Eight into one of the three categories ranging from most conservative to most progressive. The first category is the uber-gradualists. These are probably the most similar to the evangelicals I talked about at the beginning of the episode in terms of duality. Uber-gradualists felt that black people needed Christian love, but were not equal to whites. So in other words, it's sort of a paternalistic white supremacy, so not violent, night-riding, cross-burning white supremacy, but one that still saw black people as inferior. They were willing to assist blacks in social progress, but only within the framework of segregation. They had little interest in integration or changing the system, but only to show charity to blacks within the existing dynamic of racial segregation. Bishops Carpenter and Harmon fell into this category. Carpenter was the closest to a hardliner on segregation, as he opposed integration within his Episcopal diocese. According to author Reverend Gardner H. Shattuck Jr., Bishop Carpenter, quote, 
hoped that by preserving the old order, based on the strict subordination of one race under another, all people would learn to accept their proper place within a benevolent but stratified society, end quote. In 1965, Bishop Carpenter actively opposed the famous Selma to Montgomery march. He said of the march, quote, This march is a foolish business and sad waste of time, a childish instinct to parade at great cost to our state, end quote. At the same time, Carpenter's son, Douglas Carpenter, says of his father that he worked to improve relations among clergy of both races, becoming the chairman of the Group Relations Committee that was tasked to help progress civil rights. As for Bishop Harmon, when reflecting on a letter from a Birmingham jail in 1983, he considered the letter, quote, a propaganda move, end quote. The next group are the metamoderates. A metamoderate position suggests a Christian practice that is socially active but bound by the law. These were desegregationists, meaning they weren't pro-segregation, but they weren't all that committed to integration either. They wanted to see some measure of social justice for Black Americans, but only within the law, meaning that any change should happen through legislative action and through the courts, not through means outside the system like protests. What meta-moderate ideology might look like today could be something like this. I'll give you an analogy. Think about Americans who look at protests against police brutality, whether it's protest marches from groups like Black Lives Matter that block traffic, or athletes who kneel during the national anthem, and say, I think it's horrible that police brutality continues to occur and I want it to stop too, but these protests aren't the way to do it. Dialogue with legislators and police and support community programs for poor black kids, that's more respectable than disruptive protests. That's what it means to be meta-moderate. These clergy were not into the protests, and they especially didn't buy into the idea of civil disobedience, the breaking of unjust laws with willingness to accept the consequences. They saw protests in general as a very last resort. And in this case, they did not feel that conditions had gotten to the point where protest and civil disobedience was necessary. About half of the Birmingham Eight were in this camp, including Durek, Grafman, Hardin, and Murray. According to an interview with Bishop Hardin, he says that members of the Birmingham Eight had publicly criticized Alabama Governor George Wallace for his infamous segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever speech weeks before Dr. King's letter, and he didn't seem to draw a connection between the call to unity and the letter from a Birmingham jail. He said, quote, Martin Luther King picked up those six names as just ideal people to address a letter from a Birmingham jail. Nolan Harmon was so mad. He called me over the telephone, and he was furious, and he wanted us to go in and protest and say that this was not fair that we were the only people who had been outspoken in rebuking the governor, and he jumps on us from a Birmingham jail. And I told him, Nolan, you're just wasting your breath. You're wasting your time. Let it go. I had letters from California and all asking me to explain why that letter was addressed to us. It was addressed to us because he found the handle to put on the letter. I'm convinced in my own mind that the letter was written before he ever got to Birmingham. I think it was studied and written, and I'm still convinced, although I could be wrong. But anyway, that was the thing that had happened, and we had rebuked the governor about this thing, and yet we were held up as the recipients of such a rebuke from the Birmingham jail. I never have felt that he treated us right there, but Lord knows there wasn't any use to argue about it. He was getting his thing done, and we would do more harm to rebuke him that wouldn't have been popular at all, end quote. The strange thing about the interview is that Bishop Hardin didn't seem to make a connection between the letters the group wrote and King's response, and it seemed as if Hardin, and likely Bishop Harmon as well, felt that they had been doing Dr. King a favor and his response was ungrateful. The other thing I wonder about is Bishop Hardin's statement that he believes that Dr. King had already pre-planned the letter from the Birmingham jail before he even got to jail. 
if you ever listen to Dr. King's speeches or read his writings, he tends to repeat a lot of the same themes. And he did that throughout his career and throughout his life of service. And so it's conceivable that he may not have pre-planned the speech, but he may have incorporated some things he had already talked about while making speeches and while writing into the letter from a Birmingham jail. And so I wonder if Bishop Hardin is mistaking that body of knowledge for pre-planning or if it's just the passage of time since the time between the incident and this interview was, I believe, a couple of decades because at this point, Bishop Hardin was pretty old when he was giving this interview. Now, Rabbi Grafman seemed to have felt similar to Bishop Hardin in terms of his response to King's letter. Rabbi Grafman viewed their actions in writing A Call to Unity as attempting to promote racial unity. His battle had been in working to improve relations between Jews and Christians in Birmingham. Receiving the rebuke from Dr. King seemed to make Grafman bitter. He did not come out to defend himself at the time, but in the 1970s, he expressed his anger publicly as he felt his inclusion in Dr. King's letter led people to believe he was a racist. And then the last category are the reluctant radicals. Reverends Ramage and Stallings round out the Birmingham Eight and fall into this category. These were men who would have just as well stood on the sidelines while the battle over integration waged. But the battle happening in their city and eventually throughout the country arrived at their doorsteps. Dr. King's stint in the Birmingham City Jail fell during Easter weekend that year. And so on Easter Sunday, black demonstrators, particularly ones from SCLC who were from out of town, went to white churches in Birmingham to see if they would be allowed to worship, and if so, if they would be segregated from white worshipers. These churches included First Presbyterian Church, where Reverend Ramage presided, and First Baptist Church, the church headed by Reverend Stallings. These men were both believers in racial integration and equal treatment for black Americans, but they led white churches in segregated Birmingham. As we talked about, Birmingham was fiercely segregated and was going through a lot of violence. And these congregations that they headed included segregationists, even in the church leadership. So these pastors were loath to take the plunge and become full-fledged activists and didn't want to publicly get into the civil rights fight. This may have been their motivation for signing on to the Birmingham Eight Letters. Well, sometimes you go to the fight and sometimes the fight comes to you. These men had no easy choices. If they refused the visitors or separated them from the rest of the congregation, this would go against their consciences and their faith-based beliefs in treating them as made in God's image. But their lives could pretty much go on as normal because segregation in Birmingham and in the South in 1963 was normal. If they accepted the visitors, They would be abiding by their consciences, but they risk division in their churches and loss of standing in their community, and potentially worse. Because white people who are vocally supportive of integration put themselves in danger of violent retribution from the KKK and White Citizens Council. When confronted with the groups of black visitors, these two pastors, Reverends Ramage and Stallings, welcomed them in, and not only that, on an integrated basis. These were men who did not want to be committed to the movement, but supported integration when they were thrust into a position where they were forced to make a decision. And it wasn't just for that one day. Once they made that decision, despite pressure from churchgoers and church overseers to change their minds, these men owned it and stood by it to the point that their congregations eventually forced them out. So let's briefly wrap up the Birmingham campaign. How did this turn out? Well, that's a good question. To make a long story super, super short. It's thought of as one of the more successful campaigns Dr. King and SCLC were involved in, though there are so many other events that were part of this too that are pretty involved and are really too involved to cover in this episode, including the Children's March, and the 1963 Birmingham riots. 
But these events and more taken together, the Birmingham campaign is believed by historians to be a turning point in the civil rights movement, as it increased public pressure on federal government and eventually led to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The letters and the context behind them give us a glimpse of the historical forces of that period in our nation's history. It's also helpful to look into because it prompts some questions that are important to ask ourselves even today. Specifically, what does it mean to be an ally? And what does it take to be an ally? These were white men, each from the South, leaders of houses of worship in a deeply segregated Southern city on the verge of major social change. And while all were considered moderates, both by King and by themselves, after all, they did call themselves the Reconciliation Committee. The Birmingham Eight differed in their views on the status quo and how they would deal with social change within their congregations. This is something to examine for those of us who consider ourselves progressive, or at least accepting and non-bigoted. We, and when I say we, I really mean we, myself included. We sometimes look at ourselves and think that we accept people, and that's enough. But once we believe we have all the answers, and we center ourselves in defining what it means to be a proper ally, we're not really being allies. Part of being an ally is humility. Recently, I learned from a Jewish rabbi that the biblical term Pharisee has a specific context in Judaism, and to use it as slang for a legalistic or judgmental religious person is out of context and offensive. I've heard the term Pharisee used that way for years in Bible studies and at Sunday services in different churches, and I've even used it that way before. Learning this context and learning that this was offensive helped me to see where I fall short, and taking that to heart will help me to better love and support Jewish people. What jumped out at me the most about the Birmingham Eight Letters, particularly A Call to Unity, is that these members of the clergy and the churches they represented varied in terms of to what degree they accepted Black Americans as equals or supported integration. Bishop Carpenter, in particular, was fine with segregation. Yet despite this variation in how they saw segregation in Black people, they were united in the belief that they had the authority to tell the Black people of their city who they should and shouldn't listen to when it came to securing their own freedom. It was as if their position as clergy and the fact that they had taken certain public stands led them to believe they had more authority than Dr. King, or by extension, more authority than local Black activists who called on SCLC in the first place to advise Birmingham's Black community. They probably should have stayed in their lane. And when the Birmingham Eight were made aware of Dr. King's response, it was difficult for many of them to hear that they weren't doing enough to be proper allies to the Black community. That centering of themselves instead of their city's Black community is something that's a bit hard for me to wrap my mind around. It was very difficult for them to come to terms with the fact that in this particular instance, they may have fallen short, especially when they felt like what they'd already done previously had been at great risk. And speaking of risk, the story of Dr. King and the Birmingham Eight is also instructive in terms of understanding what it means to go beyond virtue signaling and really count the cost of taking a stand. There are times when being an ally has a real cost. Loss of a job, loss of reputation or social standing, desertion by family and friends, even loss of a person's health and life. And that should not be underestimated. Reverends Ramage and Stallings ended up in that position just as they had been calling for moderation, content to sit on the fence. In episode 47, I talk about white people in the 1960s like Viola Leoso, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, Reverend James Reeve, all people who could have easily stayed out of the Southern civil rights fight, but left the comfort of their own communities to make a difference for blacks in the South, and they paid for it with their lives. Today, we can look to people like Heather Heyer, who lost her life to a domestic terrorist 
while participating in a counter-protest against white supremacy. How far are we willing to go? And also, what would we truly do if, like Reverends Ramage and Stallings, the fight comes to us and all the choices are difficult? And when we make that decision, to what degree will we keep in mind that our decisions, as hard as they might be, may not always compare to those who can't avoid the realities of living with the oppression they face for some aspect of who they are or what faith they believe in? These are tough questions, with answers tougher to come by. While, of course, the story of Dr. King in the Birmingham 8 is very much centered on race, We can also consider this story within the framework of being an ally in not only a racial context, but in other contexts, because most of us have several identities, and intersectionality matters. So even if we're part of an affected group in one context, we often have privilege in another, and we have opportunities to be allies to our fellow humans whose experiences differ from our own, and it's quite possible that this story poses more questions than answers. It's okay to not have the answer. We grow more from the asking. Thank you very much for listening to this Patreon bonus episode of Potstirer Podcast. We definitely appreciate your contribution to the Flying Machine Network Patreon. It truly helps us deliver more wonderful creative content. Make sure you check out this month's bonus episodes from the other great podcasts on the Flying Machine Network and go to flyingmachine.network slash blog to read our active Flying Machine Network blog. And check out potstirrerpodcast.com for regular episodes and more. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free. I give you... The Incredible Flying Machine!